Okay, so today we're going to look at chapter four. So here in chapter four, we're picking up right after your first exam. So first exam, we're really trying to get the groundwork set um, for the rest of the course. So hopefully you're familiar with all the terminology that we used on exam one. You're familiar with how we pr prepare our basic journal entries, those normal balances, how we do our closing accounts and our adjusting entries and how we prepare our financial statements. And all of that is hopefully fairly well understood um, by you at this point. And if that is the case, then you're in a good spot coming into chapter four. Um, if you're not, it might be worth taking a couple of minutes and reviewing some of those topics or coming by my office and talking to me, sending me an email, trying to make sure you, um, you understand all that foundational stuff. Um, because now we're going to start getting into some more uh, specific areas of accounting. So pretty much everything we've covered up until now applies just broadly across all of accounting. Um, what we're looking at here in chapter four, though, is going to primarily deal with what we call merchandising operations. So when we look here in chapter four, we want to realize how income gets reported for different types of organizations. For what's called a service company, so think like an accounting firm, right? You come in, you pay them to, pre to prepare your tax return, they do so, they book revenue, but the wages they pay to the employees or the CPAs to actually prepare those um, tax returns for you is going to be their expenses, along with things like overhead, running electrical and property taxes and all that kind of stuff. All that stuff that they're having to do to actually be able to provide you the service will be an expense. The difference in those two items will come out to be net income. For a merchandiser, it's a little bit different because with a merchandiser, they're not selling a service so much as they're selling a product. So here's the deal, right? You walk in to Academy and you look at something and you buy, right? Say you play golf and they've got a new set of golf clubs you want. You go grab the golf set and you take it up at the front, you check out, you're good to go, right? You bought a product. You can take it straight off the shelf, take it right up to the counter and purchase it. But with a service provider, right? Let's now think about maybe a salon, right? So they do haircuts and things. You can't walk in and pick a haircut off the shelf and leave with it. That doesn't work. That's not how it goes. So it's a little bit different in how we account for these two types of companies. So in this chapter, we're primarily concerned with the merchandiser. So the person or the business is actually selling, in this case, completed goods. So maybe they're selling golf clubs or clothing. Maybe they're selling parts for your car or for something else. But that's what we're dealing with here in chapter four is this idea of sales um, related to merchandisers. So you'll notice we still start with net sales just like we did before. If, you know, here they call it revenue, but it's the same issue, right? We're dealing with the same thing essentially. And we're still ending with net income. So the bookends of this are very similar. It's the stuff in the middle that changes a little bit. Notice the big change is immediately after net sales. For a merchandiser, we have this special cost, and it's called cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is where our inventory will go to once we have sold it. So before the sale occurs, our inventory sits on the balance sheet in an account called inventory. But once it has been sold, it has to come off the balance sheet. So we'll credit the asset inventory, but we need a debit and that debit will be moving us over to the income statement with the account cost of goods sold. This is a type of expense account, but it's such an important expense account, we'll actually list it in its own line up on the income statement at the very top. So we'll have net sales. Immediately after that, we'll find cost of goods sold. And right below that, we will have our first subtotal, which is gross profit. So once we've gotten our gross profit, we'll then back out any other expenses, things like salaries expense, wages expense, utilities expense, anything like that. Then once we've backed out all of our expenses, we'll of course be able to calculate net income. Now you'll notice the difference here in how these income statements look. So when I'm looking at Nordstrom, which is of course a merchandising company, they sell clothing and other items. They follow this pattern of net sales minus cost of goods sold as gross profit, which is a very important formula you definitely want to know. We'll be leaning on that formula for several of our other formulas as well. 
Um, so definitely an important one to know for the exam. Minus expenses gives you net income. But for the service company, it's a little bit more straightforward. It's simply revenues minus expenses equals net income. So do be aware of that. Now, here's the deal. When we have an operating cycle, it's essentially how long it takes us to go from point A through the entire process all the way back around to collecting cash. So for a merchandiser, what this means is we start by purchasing the good that we plan to sell. We then move that into our inventory account. Eventually we'll make a sale, typically on credit. So I'll have that credit sale, which will create an accounts receivable. At some point that accounts receivable will turn hopefully into cash. So we'll collect cash. We'll then use that cash to purchase more inventory, which will then generate more sales, which will generate more accounts receivable, which will then result in more cash and the cycle goes on and on and on. And this is what we see for a merchandiser. Now, this right here is perhaps my favorite graphic in the entire course. I do think you need to memorize this one and I do think you need to be able to recreate it from memory. Thankfully, it's a pretty logical graph for us and it may be my favorite if only because it's so simple. So what we see here is something that we'll be talking about not only in this chapter, but in many chapters to come, pretty much any time we are dealing with inventory, we're also dealing with cost of goods sold. So this really helps us place these items in relation to one another and really helps us stay organized. So here's the deal. When we're dealing with inventory, you start with some amount always. It could be zero, right? If you're a new company, your beginning inventory is zero, but there's always a number that can be assigned to beginning inventory. Next, we're going to add in what is called our net purchases. This is anything that we bought minus anything we had to send back, right? So if we bought something and it was defective or whatever the case was and we didn't keep that and we sent it back to the manufacturer, well, that's gonna come out. And what we're left with is our net purchases. Those two items together, beginning inventory plus net purchases, gives us what is called merchandise available for sale or inventory available for sale, right? So this is what we have in total. So if I had nothing, I bought $10,000 worth of stuff, I've now got $10,000 that is available. At this point in time, that full $10,000 rests on which financial statement? Hopefully what you just said is the balance sheet because inventory is of course an asset. So right now we've got $10,000 on the balance sheet in inventory. But what if instead of the amount being just on the balance sheet, we actually sold say 20% of that? Well, if 20% of that was sold, that means that there should only be 80% of that left on the balance sheet. So we have 10,000 right here, 80% running through to ending inventory is 8,000 and 20% got sold, running through to my income statement in cost of goods sold for $2,000. This can then be solved backwards. So 8,000 plus 2,000 is of course 10,000, which is equal to 10,000 plus zero. So it works in either direction, however you want to go about it. Another really useful way to use this is to realize that you can go and deal with this in terms of units as well. So if I had zero units and I bought a hundred more units, well, I've got a hundred units available for sale, which means if I sold um, 20, then I've got 80 units left in ending inventory. I strongly recommend you track both units and dollars to help you make sure that you don't drop something along the way. But it's a very powerful graphic. It's very useful as we move through this chapter and the remainder of the semester. So, basically two broad categories of inventory systems that we need to talk about. The first that we're going to talk about is what is called a perpetual system. A perpetual system is what happens when every time there's a purchase or sale, those inventory records are immediately updated. So I want you to think, you go to Walmart, you have 10 items in your basket, you go to the self-checkout and you scan those. What happens when you swipe that barcode across the scanner, right? That machine goes beep beep, right? And it beeps at you indicating that it has recorded the transaction. 
But what's actually happening here is with every beep, right, every item you swipe across that barcode scanner, you are generating two journal entries in Walmart's records. So, quick question, how much do you want to go look at all of Walmart's records, right? You can imagine the billions of journal entries that are being made every year in Walmart's system. So hopefully they've got some good internal controls in place to make sure those um, transactions are being recorded properly. But that's what's happening. One journal entry is being made to record the revenue. So hopefully a debit to cash, a credit to sales revenue, bam. That's their first journal entry. The second one they're going to have to make though is to reduce their inventory. So they're gonna debit cost of goods sold and credit that inventory for that specific item. So they know, okay, well you just bought a loaf of bread and if you bought it, then we don't have that loaf of bread anymore. And this enables them to reorder bread or whatever else at a specified time, as soon as that inventory level hits, say, 100 loaves of bread, we place an order for more bread. And this is a perpetual system. It's very useful. They tend to provide better information than periodic systems, but they're, of course, more difficult to implement and more expensive because it requires that you have a barcode scanner, that you've got inventory software set up that can handle this amount of information, that you've got everything in the store barcoded, so it takes quite a bit of an investment to actually set up a perpetual system, but if you can do it, it does give you really solid information most of the time. Now, on the other hand, you've got periodic systems, and these simply update records at the end of the accounting period. So maybe every month, quarter, or year, they come in and do a physical inventory and say, okay, well, we started with a million dollars in stuff. We've now got $615,000 in stuff. That difference is three eighty-five. dollars that 385 must have been sold. Now, you see a hole in this periodic system because I think there's a pretty glaring issue here. And this is that when you come in with this periodic system, you are making an assumption that anything that is not currently in inventory was sold. But what could have happened to some of that stuff? Let's think back to our Walmart example. Does Walmart sell anything that could go bad? Okay, so let's think, things like milk, things like bread, things like the fruits and vegetables that they have up front typically. All those things could expire. Is it possible that some of Walmart's stuff that is possible to actually expire, that is perishable, that some of it will expire before it is sold? Well, of course it is. But under a periodic system, they would be treating all those expired items as sold. They would also be treating any items that grew legs and walked out the door or were stolen, right? All those items would also be ran through cost of goods sold. So there are some problems with a periodic system, but typically much cheaper to implement, much easier to deal with. Now, that said, what does GAP say about a physical inventory? So if any of you have ever worked in retail, okay? So for example, when I was in high school, I did. I worked at Academy. So I worked at Academy and every year, once a year, toward the end of the year, we would, I don't remember when their, their year end is. It may or may not be 1231. Um, I can't remember for sure. But right as that company's year end was coming up, we would have to go do a physical inventory of the store, which meant we had to come in and unbox every box to go through all the top stock, go through all the stuff, all the pegs, all the stuff in the warehouse and see exactly what we had. So at this point, we would typically find all kinds of stuff, right? We'd find stuff that customers had hidden to come back for and they'd get replaced, you know, wherever they were supposed to go because we didn't know why they were there, but they weren't in the right spot. We'd find stuff that, you know, was broken. We'd find stuff that had been returned and booked in wrong and all kinds of stuff. You find all kinds of things when you go back and do these physical inventories. So that said, do you think I'm required under US GAAP to do a physical inventory every year even if I'm using a perpetual system? And the answer is, of course, yes. Regardless of your inventory system, you must do at least one physical inventory each year. And that is to make sure that everything is properly stated. I cannot tell you the number of times I had people call me and say, hey, do y'all have this specific basketball goal? Or do y'all have this specific item that we keep back in the storage way back across the parking lot, typically in a, in a separate area? 
um, did we have that in stock? Well, I would go to the computer, I'd pull it up and I'd say, yes, on the computer, right? It says we have three of them. And I did that for a while. And then once or twice, people would show up and I would go back there to get it for them. And that was not actually there. For whatever reason, maybe somebody scanned the wrong barcode and thought a different item got sold. Maybe someone had broken in there and stolen one or two items. Who knows what happened? But for whatever reason, when it actually came time to go put my hands on the product, the product had disappeared. So these perpetual systems are great. They do a much better job of you know, identifying what you have and what you need than a periodic system, but they still have their own problems. For that reason, you are still required to do a physical inventory at least once a year, regardless of if you choose a perpetual or periodic method. Now, what we want to look at here is this item of actually seeing how these purchases happen. So in this class, we're going to be primarily concerned with a perpetual system is the journal entry method that we'll be using. In the appendix, I believe it does cover the entries for periodic. I do not require you to go over those. If I do change my mind on that, I will make an announcement in class. We will go over it in class, but typically we simply cover the perpetual system for the lack of time as we don't typically have enough time to cover both methods. If for whatever reason we do have enough time, we may briefly cover um, periodic. It is certainly not, you know, um, impossible for us to do so. I believe I've covered it once or twice, but typically we just don't have the time, so we stick with simply perpetual. So if you need to cover the appendix, I will make that known in class. If you are uncertain, feel free to ask that and I will inform you um, of that. But typically we will simply focus here on the perpetual system since this is an introductory class. Unless we just have an abundance of time for some reason, um, we, will, we will stick with that. So in this case, we are looking on November the 2nd, our company Z-Mart, and remember we are the company, purchased $500 worth of merchandise inventory for cash. Now in this textbook, they refer to inventory as merchandise inventory basically every time, if not exactly every time. Um, I will typically just refer to this as inventory, but please note, right, if you're doing something in McGraw-Hill, you will need to find the account called merchandise inventory as that's the account title they are looking for. Uh, for the sake of brevity, and so I don't have to say merchandise inventory 10,000 times, we'll simply refer to this as inventory from here on um, in the verbiage. So do be aware of that um, small distinction as you're working through stuff. If you look on your homework and you say, well, there's not an inventory account, where is it? Uh, just keep looking around. You'll find merchandise inventory eventually, and that'll be the account you're looking for. Now notice, in this case, you bought inventory. Inventory, of course, is an asset. Assets increase with a debit because their normal balance is, of course, a debit. So debit to merchandise inventory increases that account balance and a credit to cash, which of course is also an asset, is decreasing that account balance. We have one asset increasing, one asset decreasing. Our accounting equation remains in balance as it should. Once again, notice your total debits are 500, your total credits are 500, indicating total debits equal total credits, and we have achieved balance there as well. Now, what happens if we actually do have a discount. So in this case, on November the 2nd, Zmart purchased $500 of merchandise inventory on account, credit terms 210 and 30. So here's the first thing you've got to understand is what the heck those terms mean. Because I'll be honest with you, if I just look at that, I have no idea what that means unless I've read the chapter. So what the chapter tells us is this is the common notation that we will see when we are dealing with discounts. So I want you to take this term, right? This whole thing is the credit terms. So two, two tells us that we get a 2% discount. So the first number is the amount of the discount, specifically a percentage. So a 2% discount is available to us. If we do what, right? So that's what the 10 is. So we get 2% off the purchase price, but only if we pay within 10 days. Right, so I get 2% off if I pay within 10 days. But if I don't pay within 10 days, the balance is due in 30 days. So 210, 2% off if I pay within 10 days. Otherwise, the net balance, right, the N is net balance is due in 30 days. So if I'm in charge of paying this bill for my company, when should I pay the bill? 
And so you say, well, within 10 days. So sure, that's a good, that's a good answer. But specifically when? If I've got 10 days to pay this bill to get the 2% discount, do I want to rush out and pay this bill on day one? No. Right? I don't get a discount for paying on day one. If I have the option, I'm paying on day 10. I will not pay on day one. I will not pay on day two. I will not pay on day nine. I will pay on day 10. Because the longer I can hold on to my cash, the better off that I am. So I will take full advantage of these terms. If I want the discount, I will pay on the very last day the discount is available. Conversely, if I don't take the discount, maybe I don't have the cash, maybe I don't feel like dealing with it, I'd rather just pay at the end of the month, whatever the case is, if I choose not to pay within day 10, maybe the bill got slipped under something, I didn't find it until day 12, right? I find the bill on day 12, do I rush and write a check on day 12? What do you think? No, right? Because once that discount period, that 10 days has expired, I'm no better off paying this bill on day 12 than I am on day 30. So for that reason, to better manage my cash, I will delay the payment on that bill until day 30. If they want me to pay before day 30, they need to adjust their credit terms. If they want me to pay before day 10, they need to adjust the credit terms. But if these are the terms I'm given, the only two dates that are acceptable for me to pay are day 10 or day 30. Now, please hear me well. I am not telling you to ever pay late, right? Don't pay on day 32. Don't pay on day 38. Pay on day 30. Do not pay late, but never pay early unless there's an incentive to do so. Now, once again, they're going over the items that we just talked about a moment ago. So this is a good graphic if you are a little bit confused as to exactly what that is. But that two, of course, represents the discount percentage. The 10 is the number of days that you can earn that discount by paying early. The N, of course, is the net amount. And the 30 is, of course, the overall credit period. So you get the discount within 10 days if you pay. If you don't pay within 10 days, you pay 100% in 30 days. So that's what we see here. Now, this is just a timeline. It does a pretty good job of showing you how this all relates over time. So here, what I'm gonna call time zero, you got your invoice date. For a certain amount of time, you have a discount available. During this point of time, the amount you would actually pay is the full invoice amount less that discount. So if the full invoice amount was 100%, which it will be, of course, and the discount amount was 2%, then you would pay 98% right here. But the second this discount period ends, notice you're now in the general credit period, which does not offer a discount, which means now you owe the full invoice amount. So that is what we see here. Now, here's an example of an invoice. I'm not super concerned. Um, that you'd be able to label all of this. If you want to see an example of how this might actually look in practice, this is a great item to look at. As far as your exam, this isn't super relevant. But as we say, um, the whole point for taking this class is to prepare you to actually be able to do this kind of work in practice. And for that reason, it is important that you understand how this works. So, in this case, you've got, of course, the company's name, the invoice date, the number of the invoice specifically, all of that information available to you. You see the terms to 10 net 30. You'll notice the freight is labeled as FOB destination. What on earth does that mean? Who knows? But I think we'll talk about it here in just a moment. But this will be incredibly important here in this chapter as well as the rest of the course. After chapter four, I will not define FOB destination again. Probably, I will just use the information as we need it for FOB destination um, and FOB shipping point. So you will need to be very familiar with those, not only here in chapter four, but of course through the rest of the course. And remember, once again, that final exam is comprehensive. So we wanna make sure we're maintaining this information, maybe reviewing old notes every so often, just to make sure you are sharp when it comes time for that comprehensive final exam. You'll notice now down below this, you of course have the items that they are purchasing, the quantity and the price. This gives you a total amount. In this case, they ignore shipping and tax. And so we have our total here. In the event that they take the discount, this will generate a total of 490 instead of 500. And we'll see how all of that works. Now, I wanna point out something. Notice here, 
you've got the payment occurring within that discount period. So here's what happens. On November the 12th, remember the purchase was November the 2nd. On November the 12th, that is 10 days later. So they are within the discount period. They are paying on the correct date. They should be paying on November the 12th and they are paying on November the 12th. You'll notice what has happened is a debit to accounts payable. Initially, we had a credit to accounts payable because we bought this on credit. So we set up a liability with a credit to accounts payable. But at that point in time, we debited merchandise inventory for the full $500. What this has done to us then is at this point in time, we've got our asset overstated. Remember back in chapter one, right? we're throwing it back once again. We're talking about this idea in chapter one of the historical cost principle. The historical cost principle tells us that we record items, specifically our assets, at the amount that we pay for them. Well, if I got my inventory for $490 instead of $500, I did not pay $500 for my inventory, which means as long as my inventory is stated at $500, it is overstated. I must bring that balance down to reflect the actual amount paid. So if I need to bring my inventory balance down from $500 to $490, then what needs to happen is a credit to inventory for $10. We'll then credit the cash account for the actual amount paid of $490, and this will wipe out the entire balance in accounts payable, allowing our $500 debit to accounts payable to be offset with two credits totaling out to $500. Now you'll notice the amount paid was calculated as $500 times 98%, and if you wanted to calculate the credit to inventory here, it's simply the $500 times 2%, which is $10. Now, this is what this looks like, of course, on our ledger. Originally, we had a debit to merchandise inventory for 500 and a credit to accounts payable. Now, at the end of the period when we actually paid this, or I'm sorry, on the actual date that we paid, which was the 12th, we came back, we had to eliminate that payable. So we had a liability with a credit balance, which is normal. We eliminated the full balance by paying it off for $500. That gives us a zero balance left that we owe. You'll notice our inventory had to be written down by $10, giving it an ending balance of $490, and our cash came out as $490. So this all looks good. Remember, historical cost principle says our inventory in this case must be valued at the amount paid. Well, our ending balance in inventory is $490, and the amount of cash paid was $490. So it looks like we did this all properly. Now, what happens if we pay after the discount period? Well, this gets a lot easier. Simply a debit to accounts payable, which is reducing that liability once again down to zero, and a credit to cash. Now, with that said, we've now got a couple of other items we need to look at. We've got what are called purchase returns and purchase allowances. So purchase returns occur when the merchandise is returned by the purchaser to the supplier. I ordered number two plywood, and you sent me number six plywood. I don't need that. You sent me the wrong stuff, I'm sending it right back to you, right? That's the way that a purchase return works. We'll talk about what that looks like. And then we'll look at what is called a purchase allowance. So a purchase allowance is simply a price reduction to the buyer when we receive defective or unacceptable merchandise. So I asked you for a certain item and what you sent me wasn't exactly right, but I can probably make it work. But because what you sent me wasn't what I really wanted or what I really asked for, then what I'm going to do is send that back to you if you don't give me an allowance. So I'm looking at returning this, but you say, wait a minute. All right, we made this custom for you. We understand we didn't quite hit the specs. It wasn't quite what you wanted. So how about instead of you paying $10,000 for this, you pay $7,000 for it. You keep it, you make it work, and we'll refund you the, the $3,000, right? Whatever the case is. So we'll look at how an allowance works. So an allowance, the purchaser, right, the buyer actually keeps the inventory, but under a return, they're actually sending it back. So two totally different situations. We want to make sure we understand how they work. So here we're going to first look at an allowance. So here on November the 5th, Zmart, the buyer, of course, issues a $30 debit memorandum for an allowance from Trex for defective merchandise. So we bought something from Trex. It was not correct. And whatever reason for whatever the case is, whatever they sent us was not what we wanted, was not what we needed, was defective in some way. So what I'm going to do is set up a debit to accounts payable. So originally when I purchased this from them, I would have debited merchandise inventory and credited accounts payable. But 
now I have not paid them yet. So because I've not yet paid them, what I'm going to do is simply reduce the amount I owe them. So I'll debit accounts payable and credit my merchandise inventory account. Doing so resets everything properly because what we've done is reduced the balance that we owe in accounts payable and we've reduced the value of that inventory once again keeping in line with that historical cost principle. If I'm getting a discount on this, which is essentially what this allowance represents, then I should not have that inventory listed at the full price on my balance sheet. So we will have to lower that account. Now, a return is a little bit more involved because we actually have the item leaving us. So we buy it, it comes in, we send it back, right? So there's a lot more movement here than just with an allowance. So in this case, Zmart purchases $250 of merchandise on June the 1st. Terms are 210 and 60. Now, what on earth do those terms tell me? We get a discount of how much? 2%, but only if we pay within 10 days. If I don't pay within 10 days, then the balance, the net amount is due when? In 60 days. So that's what we need. Okay. Now it's very likely on your exam, I will have questions where you have to understand that terminology to be able to do the math to solve a question. But it is also very likely, I may just have a question that says, what do the terms 315 and 45 mean? And you'll have to tell me, well, that means you get a 3% discount if you pay within 15 days. Otherwise, the balance is due in 45 days. All right. So I could just have a question in the multiple choice specifically where I just say, hey, interpret these terms for me. And as long as you can do that, you may pick up a couple of points doing so. So very important that you understand how these terms work because I can almost guarantee you're going to have a question about either a return, an allowance, something along those lines, maybe a purchase that deals with these terms and without understanding them, you will be lost among the accounting on how to actually solve for all the numbers. So. Here we go. On June the 3rd, we returned $50 of goods before paying the invoice. Okay? Now, when Zmart pays on June the 11th, they take the 2% discount on the remaining balance. So I'm going to be honest with you. This is a lot nicer than I tend to be. If this was a question I had written, I would have simply told you on, on uh, June the 1st, Zmart purchased inventory for $250 with these terms. The, on June the 3rd, they returned uh, $50 worth of goods and they paid the bill on June the 11th. All right, they've given you a lot more information here than I would give you where you would really have to understand what was going on. Because here's the deal. If you return the goods on June the 3rd, but you don't pay till June the 11th, do you see that that happened before you paid the cash? So I shouldn't really have to tell you that June the 3rd, we paid or we returned the goods before the cash was paid because you can pull that out of the information. So make sure you're reading these things very carefully so that you understand the order. On June the 1st, we purchased something. Well, what happens when I purchase inventory? It's pretty straightforward. At this point, it's simply a debit to merchandise inventory, which is an asset which is increasing, and a credit to accounts payable, which of course is a liability, which is also increasing with a credit, and your inventory of course is increasing with a debit. So we've got our two accounts going up, keeping our accounting equation once again in balance. Now on June the 3rd, when this return happens, what needs to occur? The first thing, that liability needs to go down because I returned some of the goods. Because I returned some of the goods, I no longer have them. So if I no longer have them, I no longer owe you for those goods. So my liability must come down. The way we lower that liability amount, of course, is with a debit to accounts payable. We then need to lower the actual inventory balance because we sent that back. So I no longer have it. If I no longer have the inventory, which is an asset, then that asset needs to be decreased. And we of course decrease an asset with a credit. So we'll take care of that next. Now on June the 11th, it is time to pay. But how much do I actually owe you? Do I owe the 250? If not, why not? So be careful, right? You owe 250 on June the 1st, but because you sent $50 back, you no longer owe the full 250. You now owe only $200. Because you only owe $200, the 2% discount that was available to you is only available on that $200. So 
First things first, wipe out the accounts payable for the full balance of 200, reducing it to zero. You'll then credit merchandise inventory for $4. Crediting merchandise inventory for $4 will of course bring that balance down to be properly stated. Let's track this through. Started at 250, returned 50. Now you're sitting at a balance of 200 minus the four would leave your inventory stated at a price of $196. Coincidentally, the amount of cash we are actually paying is $196. So have we applied that historical cost principle correctly? Absolutely. Because remember, we value our assets at the amount that is paid for them. Even though this came in initially at 250, then we sent some back, then we took a discount, that rule is still true. So remember, we paid off a $200 bill in the end for 196 because we took advantage of that $4 discount. Now, next item that we want to talk about is incredibly important in this chapter and future chapters. So make sure you understand it, okay? I know I feel like I say that all the time, but it's true. This course really builds on itself. So we want to make sure we're understanding what we're doing in each chapter so that we don't get behind later. So first two things on this chapter are the two different types of shipping terms. Sorry, on this slide are these two types of shipping terms. We've got FOB shipping point and FOB destination, okay? The FOB simply means free on board. I don't care that you understand that that's what it means, okay? I guess there might be a multiple choice question that asks what it means, but truthfully, it's useless to us. So what I would do if I were you, I would ignore that FOB label and I would simply deal with shipping point and destination. That part that comes after FOB simply tells you where ownership changes hands. So what you're noticing is under FOB shipping point, the ownership changes as soon as the goods are loaded onto the truck and sent off. At that point in time, the seller no longer owns this, it is now the buyer's. Conversely, with FOB destination, it remains the seller's item until it finally gets delivered at the final destination. So this is the difference. And you say, well, who cares? The only difference is the, the time it's in the truck, essentially. Why does that matter? Well, I want you to think specifically toward the end of the year. We just had Christmas. We just had the end of the last year. So what you're looking for here is what happens for inventory that's put on a truck say under FOB shipping point. Okay, if it's FOB shipping point and it was put on the truck on 1231, at that point in time, the company no longer owns the item. That is because as soon as they put it on the truck, it is now the property of the purchaser. So what just happened is these companies selling the inventory can actually go ahead and book revenue and reduce inventory right now in the current period. But that also means that the buyer must reflect the purchase of this and include this inventory in their actual inventory on their balance sheet, even though it's still on a truck 3,000 miles away. It is their inventory. So when you actually go do a physical count, you're going to have to remember to think about all these things that you paid for FOB shipping point. Now the other side of this is FOB destination. So with FOB destination, at 1231, if Amazon puts something on a truck, in California to deliver, say somewhere down in Florida, right? Incredibly unlikely. They've got a much better distribution network than this, but we're going to take an extreme here just to make this very obvious. There's no way to get from that distribution point in California on 1231 by truck all the way down to the southeastern tip of Florida on 1231. It just can't happen. So what's going to happen is on 1231, they will not yet have a sale because they have not yet finished the service. They do not get to actually book revenue until the actual goods are delivered all the way down on that southeastern coast of Florida. At that point, then they get to book the sale. So here's the deal. Who pays the shipping? Okay, so this is the real question here, and this is why it matters. So under FOB shipping point, now I want you to think, goods go on the truck, truck driver starts driving down the road. Something jumps out in the middle of the road, truck driver swerves off, jumps out of the truck, truck goes flying off the cliff, bursts into flames down at the bottom of the cliff. Everything in the truck is destroyed, truck driver is safe, no harm, no foul. 
But what just happened with that inventory and who is responsible? So if this was an FOB shipping point, then the ownership transfers at the time the items are loaded in the truck and the truck takes off. What this tells you is that that inventory belonged to the buyer the whole way. Well, if it belongs to the buyer, the buyer pays shipping. And if the buyer pays shipping, they're the one that needs the shipping insurance to cover something like the truck flying off a cliff, exploding at the bottom and everything burning up in a fire. But if you're dealing with FOB destination, then that means that ownership does not change hands until the actual goods get delivered, which means the entire time the items are in the truck, they're the property of the seller. What that then means is the seller is the one responsible for paying the shipping cost and for actually paying for that shipping insurance. So when you go on Amazon and you see free two day shipping, what you are really seeing there is that Amazon is employing this method of shipping called FOB destination where they're saying it is actually Amazon's item all the way up until they deliver it to your door. Once they deliver it to your door, you sign for it and you pick it up on your porch, whatever happens, then that is your item. But until that second, it is actually still the property of Amazon. And so this is how shipping works. And we'll deal with this as we go through. They go ahead and show you how the journal entries look. So under FOB shipping point, the buyer pays the transportation costs which means that will be treated as part of inventory because we stated earlier in the semester, I believe that inventory is not just the purchase price of inventory, but also any cost necessary to receive it, to get it set up, installed, anything like that will be the price of that asset. And of course, they'll simply pay that with cash. So it simply goes into inventory, which will then of course be moved over to cost of goods sold on the income statement when the inventory is actually sold in the future. When we're dealing with FOB destination, the seller is paying for the shipping, which means it is simply treated as another expense and a debit to delivery expense, of course, on the income statement immediately and a credit to cash. So here we go, Zmart purchase merchandise, FOB shipping point. Transportation charge is $75. They purchased its FOB shipping point. Because of that, they are paying the shipping. They'll simply add this to inventory and credit cash. So a debit to inventory, a credit to cash. Now. Here we're gonna look at the actual cost of our purchase. So we have an invoice cost of our merchandise of 35,800, but we received a discount of $4,200 for whatever reason. We had a purchase return and allowance of $1,500 as well. We added the transportation cost that we had to pay, which gives us the total net cost of merchandise purchases of just over $232,000. Now, we're gonna look at the other side. So we've looked at the purchase side, now we need to look at the sales. So here we have our net sales. Notice this is our gross sales, which is our total number of sales, our top number, minus a couple of things. So here we're gonna look at things like discounts, returns and allowances, all being contra revenue accounts. That will bring us down to our net sales number, which of course is the top line of our income statement is net sales typically, minus cost of result will give us that gross profit number. Notice here, each sales transaction for a seller of merchandise involves two entries. So in this chapter and every chapter from here on, when I have you make a sale of something, you have sold inventory, whatever the case, there are two journal entries you must make. They're both vitally important. The first is revenue received in the form of an asset. So what that means is somehow you've generated revenue and you got something. Maybe it was cash, maybe it was a promise to pay called an accounts receivable. Maybe they gave you land or a truck or a building or equipment. They gave you something in return. So you got some kind of asset. And of course, the recognition of the cost of that merchandise that you sold to the customer. So this is where you're going to have to reduce the inventory balance on your balance sheet and increase your cost of goods sold. We'll look at how this works here. Zmart sold $1,000 of merchandise on credit. The merchandise has a cost basis of $300. So right away, if I asked you, bam, what is the gross profit on this sale? You should be able to tell me $700. It is my sales price of 1,000 minus my cost of goods sold of 300, which gives me gross profit of 700. But if I actually look at my journal entries, all right, and I'll be very honest with you, you need to be extremely careful on your exam. If it asks you for the revenue side, this is the journal entry you must record. If it asks you for the cost side, this is the journal entry you must record. If you get them flipped, they will both be completely wrong. 
Okay, so be very careful as you're answering. Don't put the cost information in the revenue journal entry or vice versa. You've got to make sure you put them in the right spot. So with the revenue side journal entry, what you are dealing with, of course, is the revenue. So the credit here is to your revenue account sales. The textbook calls this sales. I will refer to this as sales revenue to drive home the point that this is a revenue account that goes on the income statement and increases equity, right? That is the reason that I will be referring to sales as sales revenue almost every time. If you're taking this in McGraw-Hill, sales is fine. If you're taking this on paper, you must write sales revenue so that I understand that you understand that this is a revenue account which goes on the income statement. If this is a written exam and you only give me sales, you will very likely lose partial credit for that account title. So in Connect, can't do anything about it. Connect goes with sales, so that's what we'll have to use. But if you're taking a written exam, if you want full credit, that account title for that credit should be sales revenue. Now, for accounts receivable, that of course is our asset. So we sold something. Notice this tells us on credit. If you see the phrase on credit, on account, anything like that, or you just see credit terms, then you will know immediately we did not receive cash. This must run through accounts receivable as we see here. Of course, accounts receivable is an asset which increases with a debit and goes on the balance sheet. So there's our first journal entry. Anytime you have a sale, the revenue side will look something like this. A debit to accounts receivable, a credit to sales. But that is only one half. Granted, that is the more pleasant half of the journal entry because that is the side that makes us look good. Now we need to deal with the side that might make us look not so good, right? which is the cost side. In this case, it's fine. right? We still generated a ton of gross profit on the sale, so it still looks okay. But the way this journal entry looks and the way that it will look every time is a debit to cost of goods sold and a credit to whatever it is that you sold, in this case, merchandise inventory, which of course I'll simply refer to as inventory. So debit to cost of goods sold, which is an expense which goes on the income statement, and a credit to merchandise inventory, which of course is an asset that goes on the balance sheet. We do see that here. Now, just like the purchase discounts, and all of those items that we saw earlier when we were buying, we can of course offer those same items to our customers in an attempt to increase the speed at which we collect cash. So all of this credit period stuff is the same as we saw earlier, but let's see how the journal entries differ. So in this case, Zmart completes a $1,000 credit sale terms to 10 and 45. So 2% discount if we receive the cash within 10 days. If not, they owe us the full amount in 45 days. So straight away, we're going to book a debit to accounts receivable, a credit to sales for the full amount. That is what happens on November the 12th. But notice what also happens on November the 12th, since we made the sale, is we also have to book the cost side. The cost, of course, being a debit to cost of goods sold for 300 and a credit to merchandise inventory for 300. Now, in the event they pay within the discount period, a couple of things happen. One, we wipe out the full balance of accounts receivable with a credit to accounts receivable of $1,000. That way we don't call them up in a couple of weeks and say, hey, you still owe us $20. And they say, no, we don't. We paid you within the discount period. The discount was $20, but now we've annoyed our customer. So we don't want to do that. So what we do is we credit the full balance for, account or for accounts receivable. Remember, accounts receivable is an asset which increases with a debit. Since it should be decreasing here, we are crediting that account. Now we're coming in with a debit to cash, but how much cash? Only 98%. They get that 2% discount if they pay within 10 days. They purchased on November the 12th, they paid on the 22nd. That is within 10 days, so they do get that discount. What that means is the cash is only 98% of 1,000, which is of course 980. At this point in time, we've got 980 for debits, 1,000 for credits. I don't think we found the one time in all of accounting history where our debits are okay with not equaling credits. In fact, I think that rule is going to hold still, even in this case. So we've got to figure out what to do with $20. So we'll go ahead and jot down the 20 and then think about where it should go. Well, in this case, we want to actually know why we lost this $20, where it went. So we're going to use a specific account called Sales Discounts. This Sales Discounts account will contain the $20 discount that we have given our customer for paying early. Now, in the case that they pay after the discount period, this is much simpler. Simply a debit to cash for $1,000 and credit to accounts receivable for $1,000. Now, the next item that we want to consider is a sales return and allowance. Of course, sales returns and allowances involve dissatisfied customers. 
and could result in lost future sales. So what we don't want is these items to occur, but if they do happen, we wanna to try to make it right as best as we can. So sales returns refer to merchandise, of course, that are, that are completely returned to us. And sales allowances, of course, is where we give them a discount to keep the defective product. So in this case, the customer returns merchandise, which sold for $15 and cost nine. So here's how this works. If we have a sales return and allowance, right, or either one, the textbook uses the account sales returns and allowances, which makes your accounting a little bit easier because you don't have to distinguish between the two. The textbook uses the same title. If you're taking a paper exam for me, I want to point out, I will take the full name sales returns and allowances. That is perfectly fine. If you want to write that every time, just to make sure you're safe, I will accept that. On the other hand, if you want to just use sales returns or sales allowances, that is fine. But be careful because if you give me sales returns and it's actually an allowance, it is wrong. If you give me sales allowance and it is actually a return, it is wrong. But if you go with the full title, you are safe. So keep that in mind as you decide, as you decide how you're going to write things down on the test. But that is the way that we are going to be dealing with this. So safest option, of course, use the full title. Um, I do accept abbreviations on the written exams as long as you've provided somewhere on that same page what that abbreviation means. So if you want to use like sales RNA for sales returns and allowances, and there's three different journal entries that require you to use that, for example, then at the top of that page or the bottom of that page somewhere very clearly, I need you to write sales returns and allowances equals sales RNA, and then I'm, I'm good with it. Um, but if you just give me sales RNA, that will be wrong. Right? I've got to make sure you understand um, what the abbreviations mean that you decide to use. So do make sure you follow that procedure. Okay, now we have dealt with the revenue side of this. So we sold it for 15. Because they returned it, we had to give them the cash back. So cash goes down by 15, which of course is an asset. Sales returns and allowances is increasing by 15. It's a contra revenue account. So we put another contra account here. And this contra revenue account, of course, goes on the income statement. It deals with that net sales computation at the very top and gets dealt with way up there. Um, and it is, of course, reducing the overall revenue amount. So we do see that going up with a debit. Remember, contra means opposite. Revenue increases with a credit. So a contra revenue increases with a debit. Now, two situations here. One, they returned merchandise that was not defective. For example, you go to the store, you buy something, you get home, you decide or you realize, oh, we already had that, you take it back, right? Is there anything wrong with the item you bought? No, but did, did you need it? No, so if you don't need it, there's nothing wrong with it, you take it back. They say, okay, is there anything wrong with the product? And you probably think, well, why do they care, right? Well, here's why, it depends on how they're going to rebook this entry. Because if there's nothing wrong with the product, they can simply rewrap it, put it back on the shelf, sell it again, good to go. But if there is something wrong with that product, they can't put it back on there at full price. So you go, you buy something, you get home, it's completely broken, doesn't work, doesn't turn on, doesn't function, doesn't do anything it's supposed to do. You take that back, they say, all right, well, why are you returning it? Did you not need it? Was it the wrong color? Did it not work? What happened? And you say, oh no, it was totally broken, everything with it, I guess when they shipped it here or something, everything inside was just shattered, right? Well, that's a different story than something that is just the wrong color, the wrong size. So what we want to make sure we are doing here is showing that difference. So in the first case, when things are not defective, it's a pretty straightforward journal entry. We simply reverse the sale. So when we sold this, we debited cost of goods sold, credited merchandise inventory. When you bring it back, we simply reverse that. A debit to merchandise inventory to put it back in the inventory account, a credit to cost of goods sold to reduce that account. Now, the next thing you want to do is come down and look if the returned goods are defective. So if the returned goods are defective, then what you're going to have to do is first start with that credit to cost of goods sold. That's where I would begin. Okay, of course, jump down a couple of lines, indent it, always make sure that credit goes after all the debits and is indented some to the right while your debits are of course up into the margin. But I would start with the easiest part of this. And the easiest part of this is if they brought it back, it is not sold. If it's not sold, it can't be in cost of goods sold. So what you're going to have to do is credit cost of goods sold. That's the very first thing that I would do. 
then you've got to figure out what to do with this nine dollars so in this case it looks like that item was really only worth two dollars by the time we figured out what all was wrong with it so we restore that two dollars back to inventory but let me ask you do you think this is the time in the entire accounting world that it's okay for debits not to equal credits because my guess here is certainly not right our debits must always in total equal our credits and that's what we see here so we've got this two dollars going back on the balance sheet and in inventory we've got the nine dollars coming off of my income statement from cost of goods sold <clears throat> that leaves a seven dollar difference so what i would do is go ahead and jot down that seven and then think what account would make sense so this is the first of these accounts that we've seen this is what is called a loss from defective merchandise so a loss is very similar to an expense. It is not an expense, but it is similar. Because it is so similar, in fact, it will be reported on our income statement as well. So when you look at your income statement, now on the second exam, we will notice four main groups of things showing up on your income statement. Revenues and expenses that we saw previously. What about dividends? Do they go on the income statement? No, remember. Dividends are a direct reduction of equity. Assuming we've got a cash dividend, it goes on two financial statements, the statement of retained earnings and the statement of cash flows. It will not touch the income statement. And it will not directly touch the balance sheet. It will indirectly in the sense that it will reduce retained earnings, which will then flow into the equity section of the balance sheet. But on our income statement, which is our focus here, we've got revenues and expenses, and then we've got two other things, gains and losses. So those are the four main categories of items that we will see throughout the semester showing up on our income statements. Here's our very first loss. So we have a loss from defective merchandise of $7, allowing that journal entry to balance out. Now, here we go. Let's look at an allowance. So assume that $40 of the merchandise Zmart sold on November 12th is defective, but the, but the buyer decides to keep it because we offered a 25% price reduction. So instead of them paying us $40, now they only have to pay us 30. So how's this work? Well, in this case, what we're going to have to do is debit sales returns and allowances for $10, and then we will credit cash. Notice the date here, right? This is the journal entry for November the 24th, okay? If we come back, you'll notice that they paid within the discount period on November the 22nd. Since they've already paid, we're having to actually return cash. So we'll debit sales returns and allowances for $10. We'll credit cash. Once again, cash is an asset, goes on the balance sheet. Sales returns and allowances is a contra revenue account. And of course, goes on the income statement with a debit normal balance. So that journal entry looks fine. Next, we want to look at some adjustments and some closing entries for our merchandising company. That's a really good. Um, graph. I will say I don't like it quite as much as our inventory graph, but that's just because this one has a lot more going on. But it is very useful for figuring out how stuff moves through time. So you'll notice from the supplier, we've got net purchases and beginning inventory, which gives us our merchandise available for sale, gives us cost of goods sold and ending inventory. So this is essentially that same inventory chart we saw previously, just rotated on the side. Okay, and then we've got some more stuff moving on to the next period. But here's what's really cool about this chart is it shows us that our cost of goods sold number hits our current period income statement right away. Boom, this period, that is where your cost of goods sold is being reported. But your ending inventory hits two places. It hits your current period balance sheet as ending inventory, that is true. But remember, the balance sheet persists across time. The income statement is only for that one period. So the income statement is January 1 of this year to 1231 of this year. At the end of 1231, everything on it gets reset. It goes to zero as of January 1 of the next year and zero all the way up until we've had sales and all that stuff happened throughout the year. And at the end of the year, we've got some numbers for the income statement, which then get reset back to zero at the end of that year to begin the next year. Income statement is always starting fresh at zero. But the balance sheet is permanent. What that means is if you have cash at 1231, it doesn't magically poof away January 1 of the next year. How horrible would that be? But on the other side, that also means your liabilities, they don't go away either. 
So if you owe somebody money at 1231 of this year, January 1, you don't get to call them up and say, oh, I'm not paying you anymore because you waited until the next year. That doesn't work. So what that means is all that stuff on the balance sheet is going to carry over to the next period. In this case, our specific account we're looking at is ending inventory. So notice, ending inventory will be reported on the current period balance sheet, of course, the current asset. But it will also be reported on the balance sheet at the beginning of the next year as beginning inventory. Because whatever we ended 1231 with, right, 1231 at 11.59 p.m. with 59 seconds, that ticking over to 12 a.m. in one second, in a couple of seconds, right, my inventory doesn't magically poof away. Whatever I ended year one with is what I start year two with. Whatever I end year two with is what I start year three with. And this is the kind of logic we're gonna need in the rest of this chapter and even in the rest of this course as well as the next course is understanding how these items move through time. So our ending inventory of year one becomes beginning inventory year two. We'll add to that our purchases, which gives us our new merchandise available for sale. Then whatever was sold will move through to cost of goods sold on our income statement. Whatever was not sold will remain in ending inventory, becoming our ending inventory balance on the balance sheet in year two and becoming our beginning inventory balance in year three. Now, here we go. What happens if at the end of the period I go and I look, right? I'm at Academy, I'm doing my physical count, and I realize after I get done, we are missing $250 worth of stuff. What happens? Do I fudge the numbers? Do I hide it? Do I cover it up? Do I, what do I do? All right, what does a good, honest accountant do? Okay, so here's what happens. We come back there, we do our count, we say, oh my goodness, we have misplaced $250 worth of stuff throughout the year. Either someone stole it, broke it, ate it, destroyed it, you know, lost it, whatever happened, $250 worth of stuff is missing. When we notice that, what we have to do is update our records. So the first thing is we're going to treat any missing items as if they were sold. So I'm going to debit cost of goods sold, which will reduce my net income because it's an extra expense on the income statement. So I debit cost of goods sold and I credit my merchandise inventory. And that of course is because my credit to merchandise inventory is showing that we don't have that item anymore. And so that is what we see. Now, We've got some new revenue rec rules that require reporting of sales at the net amount expected. Um, we're not going to deal with this too heavily in here, but we might talk about it um, from time to time. So here we've got closing entries for our merchandisers. So remember, back in chapter three, we dealt with closing entries um, for our service providers primarily. So here we're looking for merchandisers. It's essentially the exact same thing. Only a few little changes. Remember we said we close revenues, expenses, and dividends. Revenues and expenses run through income summary. We then close income summary through retained earnings and we debit um, retained earnings and credit our dividends to get rid of it at the end. So essentially the same process is happening. But we've got a couple of extra accounts that only apply to merchandisers here. So the first one is sales. Um, so we see a debit to sales or credit to income summary. That's how we're going to get rid of those revenue accounts. Next, we're going to close all those debit balances into income summary. Pretty much everything here is the same um, with a couple of key exceptions. We will see things like sales discounts, returns and allowances and cost of goods sold for a merchandiser. You just don't have that with a service provider um, because I'm not selling you a product so you can't return anything. I can't let you keep it for less. There's not a good being sold in the same sense. So those accounts just don't exist. Um, for service providers. So those will be new items having to be closed out for your merchandiser. We've then got um, the closing of income summary. So in this case, we had 321,000 as a credit to income summary, 308,000 as a debit, which of course means there was a credit balance left in income summary. That credit balance will then have to be debited to bring income summary down to zero with a credit to retained earnings. Notice here, credit to retained earnings, of course, is increasing equity because retained earnings is part of equity and equity increases with a credit. This makes sense to us because we had more revenue than we had expenses, which tells us that retained earnings should be increasing and in fact it is. So that all looks good to us. Next, we see that retained earnings will be debited for 4,000 because we paid a cash dividend in this case of $4,000 or rather declared 
a cash dividend of $4,000. So we'll see that as well. Now, next thing we wanna look at is what is called a multiple step income statement. So here we're going to see very similar to what we saw whenever we looked at the classified balance sheet versus an unclassified balance sheet. It's just got a few more, a few more sections. It's no more difficult. It's just a little bit more organized, a little bit more useful for us as we're actually using this to make decisions for our business. So first thing we want to look at, of course, is the title of our financial statement. This will be the same type of title that you will see on every financial statement we ever prepare. If I have you prepare one, you will be required to give me a formal title. It will have the company's name as the first line today, tomorrow, and every day until the end of time. The first line on any financial statement is your title of the company. Next, you will tell me what financial statement you are preparing. In this case, you are preparing the income statement. You will need to tell me that. I need you to tell me, is this an income statement? Statement of retained earnings, balance sheet, statement of cash flows. That will be the second line. And finally, you will properly date your financial statement. Notice for the multiple step income statement, this date says for the year ended 12-31-2019. It does not say as of 12-31-2019. Very important distinction. This financial statement says for the year ended 12-31-2019 because it is a period financial statement. Okay. But a key distinction between the income statement and the balance sheet, which are our two primary focuses in this course, is that the balance sheet will say as of 12-31-2019, and that is because the balance sheet is as of that one specific date. How much cash do we have on hand on that day? How much do I owe people? How much equipment do I have? How much do we have in land, in buildings? All those types of things is as of that one specific date. But the income statement is a period financial indicating it covers an, a range of time. So this is for the year ended. That period of time is the year that ends 12-31-2019. And that is why it is so important that we have that distinction there. Now, all of that was our title. We now need to look at the actual format of the financial statement itself. Notice we have sales. And this is your gross sales, okay? So this is total sales. But notice our net sales is actually the difference between the 321 and these two items, your sales discounts, sales returns, and allowances, which gives you net sales of 31700 In this textbook, I believe they do have you do this computation fairly frequently on the face of your income statement. In practice, this is rarely done. In practice, what will happen is you will have Net sales be your top line. It will say 314700 and it will say C note A in the back or whatever, and they will show you this computation in the notes to the financial statements. We typically don't see these types of formal calculations on financial statements, um, but you could, right? It's not incorrect to do so. It's just less common. So we do see that. Now we see next our cost of goods sold coming out of 230400 They show you how they got that. To get that, they ran through that um, big chart that we talked about earlier. They plugged some things in. They said, well, we've got beginning inventory of 19,000. We purchased 232. They gave us a total of 251,400. We realized then we had $21,000 left in ending inventory, which means we must have sold what was not still in inventory, which was 230,400. There's your cost of goods sold number, which gives you gross profit of 84,300. This is the first section of your multi-step income statement. Next, you've got your operating expenses, followed by your general and admin. Okay, so we've got things like depreciation expense on store equipment, um, sales salaries expenses, rent expense on the selling space, store supply expense. All these items are selling expenses for $42,100. You then got your general and admin or your GNA, right? So normally you'll hear this um, commonly referred to as SGNA, so selling general and admin is what we're talking about when you hear that, ex that expression. Um, here, your general admin total out to 29.3, which gives you a total between these two of 71,400. 71,400 from 84,300 is 12,900. This is your income from operations. Now, this is the number you want to base a decision on. Okay, so if you look at a company and they have a astronomically high net income, so this was $10 million down here, but 
their income from operations was negative, then I would say that company is in severe distress. There's a very good chance that company will not persist if things don't change. Now, this year, granted, with the pandemic and everything, very likely you could get a bad read on this, okay? Maybe their industry was down, especially if you had something like a tourist industry, you had anything that requires travel, maybe an airplane company, anything like that, probably not a great year um, just because of all the restrictions and the lockdowns and everything. So it may be a little bit misleading, but that's what we see. So if I was asking you to actually make a decision whether to invest in a company or another company, you would typically be better off making that decision if you were only using their income statement, okay, which is a whole nother conversation and not something I would recommend. But if you, for some reason, had to make a choice and you could only use their income statement, you're better off in the long run making that decision based off their income from operations because this is the repeatable stuff that they can do. This is McDonald's selling hamburgers. This is Ford selling cars. This is any company selling their main product is what income from operations is derived from. But all this other stuff is typically one-time stuff. So stuff like earning interest. Maybe they bought a CD and they earned a little bit of interest. Maybe they sold a building and got a big gain. So let's imagine this. For example, McDonald's comes in. They've got income from operations this year of negative a billion dollars, right? They just lost a ton of money. For whatever reason, people really didn't go to McDonald's or they really messed up their expenses and they just had a tremendous loss this year. So if that is the case, what happens? So you come down, you look, and you see their net income is $10 billion, okay? So you say, well, how'd that happen? Right, they lost a billion dollars doing what they do, right? Buying food and selling it to consumers, all right? They cook it, they serve it, they do all that stuff. That is their main job. That is what they exist to do. Well, when they come through with a negative from income operations and a huge amount for other revenues and gains, what is likely happening is they are selling their assets to generate gains. So somehow they've got a building that's worth a million dollars. Someone paid them 2.5 for it. And they do this with 10,000 locations and all sorts of equipment and everything else. And by the time they get done liquidating all this stuff, they've got gains of $11 billion. Well, that 11 billion offsets the 1 billion that was their negative income from operations. You come down, you look, you see net income, $10 billion. You say, wow, McDonald's had an excellent year. I need to hurry and invest in McDonald's. But what you just did is you invested in a company that sold every asset they own. They're not able to do anything next year. Next year is certainly going to be a huge loss because here's the deal. Can you inflate your income statement one time by selling a bunch of stuff and booking a bunch of gains? Sure but that can't be repeated because how many times can I sell a building? One. Once I've sold it, it's not mine to sell again. How many times can I sell land? Exactly one. Once it's sold, it's not mine to sell again. So you want to be very careful of this other section. Okay? It is important. It does go on the income statement. There's a reason it is treated separately under a multiple step income statement. That's because it is from non-operating activities which means this is much less likely to be repeated than the items up here that actually are your bread and butter operations. Okay. Once you take your total income from operations, add in your total other revenues and gains, expenses and losses. In this case, that adds $2,000. You come down to net income of just under $15,000. Now, under a single step income statement, you'll notice your net income number is the same, but you'll notice we simply group things by revenue and then expense. And you'll notice here the gains are included with revenues. The expenses include any losses if they were there. But in this case, we've just got that interest expense coming through. So much less useful to us. Is it still good to see that the income is $14,900? Sure. But I would not feel nearly as comfortable making decisions with this financial statement as I would with this financial statement. Okay. Now, once again, we've got our balance sheet. Here we see our uh, classified balance sheet indicating how we talked last time about our order of liquidity. So we talked about this and we said our acronym here or our mnemonic was can she really invent something practical? So CSRISP. So we said cash was, of course, first because 
it is cash already. Liquidity is simply how long does it take to turn this into cash, and cash is cash. So not very long. Next, we said was short-term investments. In this case, they don't have any, so they didn't list them. Next, we said was receivables. So R, so there's our accounts receivable next. Then we said inventory, which is, of course, listed next. Then they've got their supplies broken out into two groups. That's fine. And finally, they're prepaid. So things like prepaid insurance, prepaid rent, prepaid subscriptions, prepaid anything. Now, here's the deal. You go up to your apartment, you prepay your rent for the year. Okay, 12 months you pay in advance. Six months in, you decide, oh my goodness, my money's a little bit tighter than I wanted. I'm really paid way ahead on my rent. I think I'd like to go get that cash back um, from them and I'll just start paying them month to month. Can you do that? Maybe. It probably depends on the contract, on the terms of the payment, all that kind of stuff. Um, but assuming you can, it's still gonna be very difficult to get cash back out of a prepaid because they already have your cash. They really don't wanna give it back to you. Um, and most of them will have something in the contract that says like, if you prepay, then you forfeit the right to receive the money, you know, um, back and revert to a monthly payment schedule or something. Um, if you really read them, they've got a lot of weird terms in there a lot of times. So it may not even be possible, but assuming it is, it is at least more difficult to get cash out of that than it is to sell your staple, right? So definitely the least liquid of those items. Now, the last couple of things in this chapter, we've got our acid test ratio. Acid test ratio we hinted at back at the end of chapter three when we talked about the current ratio. Remember current ratio is just current assets divided by current liabilities, but our acid test ratio is what is called our quick assets divided by our current liabilities. It does a little bit better job of indicating if a company will be able to actually pay back their debts. So notice here, with the asset test ratio, this is cash plus our short-term investments plus receivables divided by our current liabilities. So you say, well, that's very similar to the current ratio, which was just current assets over current liabilities. And I would say, yes, you are correct. It is very similar, but there are a few key exclusions. So notice what is not included in that numerator. Inventory, not included. Supplies, not included. Prepaid, not included. So a lot of stuff left out of that numerator that is included with your current ratio. So it's a much more conservative ratio that gives you a little bit better look at, well, are we just really bloated with inventory? Because what's the problem with inventory? I can't pay bills with inventory. I have to have cash most likely or some kind of investment I can quickly turn over, or receivables, which I can factor. I have to have some way to get that cash very quickly to be able to pay off my bills. And if I don't have it, right, if it's still wrapped up in inventory, I've still got to sell it. Then it's got to go through credit sales. Then it's got to sit in receivables. Then I've finally collected, but it takes a while. Prepaids, we've already discussed, extremely difficult to get stuff out of. And supplies, they're not really meant to be paying back creditors with. And if we're having to sell our own stapler, our own ink out of our own printer, then it's probably a sign of severe economic distress for your organization. So you wanna be very careful there. So acid test ratio, very similar to the current ratio, but slightly different, a few major exceptions. Good rule of thumb here is you want your acid test ratio to have a value of at least one. Okay, same thing, we use the same rule um, for the current ratio, at least one indicates that you at least have enough current assets to pay off your current liabilities. Um, but once again, the current ratio is kind of bloated. It includes a lot of stuff that's not really good for paying off current liabilities. So the more conservative test is the acid test ratio. Um, sometimes this will dip below one, um, but hopefully not too much. Um, so that is what we see there. Now, here we come in, we look at this for Nike. We see cash, short-term investments, and receivables over current liabilities. So they've got their total quick assets versus their current assets. So if I asked you, for example, what amount of their current assets are not quick, all you would do is, of course, take the difference here, and you could tell me whatever that number is, um, about $6,800 or so it looks like, um, sorry, $7,800 um, here, but not really here nor there. What we're trying to see here, though, is really a trend. So notice, two years ago, Nike's current ratio is 2.5 up to 2.8, up to 2.9. Now, I don't know what years this data is from, so this may or may not still be true. Um, so do keep that in mind, of course, with any of the things that are current one year, two years ago, 
um, as this video ages, these will become certainly different. Um, but for the purpose of this video, this will work. And notice once again, as their current ratio has been ticking up, so too as their acid test ratio. On the other hand, if you look at Under Armour, you'll notice their current ratio two years ago was over three, which was better than Nike, but their acid test ratio was primarily or was significantly lower. What this probably indicates, right, the most likely culprit of a very low acid test ratio is an extremely high level of inventory. So what I would say here is it looks like Under Armour is carrying much more inventory than Nike. So we come in, we look at our current ratio, still declining, so 3.1 to 2.9, down to 2.2, but you will notice their acid test ratio actually ticked up just a little bit. And that is probably because they managed their inventory a little bit better, got it down a little bit tighter, which resulted in this acid test ratio bumping just a little bit. And then finally, in the next year, as their current ratio fell dramatically, it was enough to actually pull their acid test ratio under one, which of course is cause um, for alarm. It's not much below one, so I mean, it's not horrible yet. Um, and since their current ratio is still well over one, they're probably fine, um, but it is definitely more concerning um, than an acid test ratio of 1.8 and 2.9 from their chief uh, competitor. So definitely something to look at there. Next, we've got our gross margin ratio. So we talked earlier about gross margin. We said that was sales minus cost of goods sold. So you see that built into the top. So gross margin ratio is gross margin over net sales or just net sales minus cost of goods sold over net sales. Once again, you see here, um, for whatever company this is, they've got their gross margin, they've got their net sales, they're able to compute gross margin ratio for each of the three years. Looks like it's pretty stable around 46%. Um, 46 two years ago up to 46.2 down a little bit. Um, certainly probably want to look into it and see what caused this change because you can see their sales did go up um, by quite a bit actually but their gross margin just barely ticked up. So something is going on here. You definitely want to figure out what is causing that because uh, this trend could be negative if it continues but so far not enough of a change for me to really move into you know full-blown panic mode. Um, at this point. With that, that of course wraps up the end of the chapter. If you do want to go through and look at the periodic information, I do uh, think it is worth looking at. If it will be tested, I will be sure to, of course, tell you that in class. Um, but if you're an accounting major or minor, I strongly recommend you review that appendix as it is heavily tested in future accounting courses and certainly something you want to be familiar with. So with that said, that wraps us up here in chapter four. So we'll see you back here for chapter five next time. Thank you all so much. Have a good one.